glad you can join me today. I'm Luana Brown, and I'm um, the program director for the Women's Health Nurse Practitioners Online Nursing Track at Regis College. So um, it's been my great pleasure to talk with um, lots of uh, great nurses, and I'm looking forward to talking with you today. Regis is doing um, a series that is looking at, you know, healthcare in general, healthcare disparities, um, nursing. There's uh, so much to talk about, especially now with um, the pandemic raging. So I'm going to give you a chance for the people that don't know who you are to just introduce yourself and then tell us a little bit about how you came to be a nurse. I'm always fascinated by that because the stories, the pathways are so varied for everyone. Yeah, thank you so much. And I'm uh, really pleased to join you today. And you are asking what time it is. It is 9 a.m. So we are a long way away. <laughs> um, we're, I'm here in Hawaii. I'm actually born and raised in Arizona. And my first career. I grew up in a very small rural border town and uh, a quarter of the girls that I went to high school with would have gotten had gotten pregnant or had children by the time we graduated. We had a daycare at my school. Um, I was the only honors kid to take home ec and it was like the third week of class and I was like oh all my classmates are parents already and I'm a freshman. Wow. So um, I didn't join nursing. Um, I didn't enter nursing because of that but I be I created a strong um, sense of caring for our community. I became the kid in high school who carried around a bag of condoms because I didn't want any of my classmates to get pregnant before they wanted to get pregnant. Wow. They were having sex, but they certainly didn't need to have children at age 13, 14, 15. Wow. You were a reproductive health champion <laughs> yes, already. I How about that? <laughs> That's yeah, great. I'm in, I'm in women's health, so I'm all about the condoms and right. the reproductive health plan, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's like, I mean, and I, and I, I believed then, I believe now, you know, we we're teaching kids how to um, balance a checkbook. We should also teach them about their health and make choices so that they have um, the authority over their bodies. They don't, when they're Definitely. older, that they, things don't happen to them, you know, when they're younger, that kind of change the trajectory of their lives. And that actually brought me to a career in public health. And so I have a bachelor's in public health and, um, and border health specifically. Mm -hmm. And I did that for several years, but I ended up moving to Hawaii a couple years after um, I graduated and didn't find the home in Hawaii in the public health community that I had so um, beautifully created in in Arizona. I felt very, very at home in public health in Arizona, but in Hawaii, I didn't find my place and started looking to become a clinician. I felt like the conversations I were having with people, I really wanted to be a clinician and I wanted to find a career that met my own personal values. And looking at everything, I looked at becoming a naturopath, a chiropractor, a physician, physician assistant, um, and I landed on nursing. I felt like the, it, the sense of caring treating the person, not the disease, um, being very grounded in the community. We tend to stay in the communities we live. And all of those really identified with my personal values. And so I went, I went through a graduate entry program in nursing. And I also did not go into acute care afterwards, like is very common. So I actually went into policy and became a nurse practitioner and worked in a community health center. Um, I, it, in my graduate studies, I had an internship with a state senator. And so I have a very different career pathway, but I think it has, um, it is very much grounded in my roots of passing around condoms to teenagers. Um, yes, you know, <laughs> which is trying to help the people who need it the most. Exactly. And that is just uh, an amazing story. And like you said, policy and that side of it is something that even those of us who've been nurses, you know, for a long time, you know, it's like we have problems and issues that are there. We know something needs to be changed, but we're not really a change agent in the sense of being on the other side of it. So it's really great to be able to talk with someone who's been involved with that at that level. So a couple of things. Yeah, it, it definitely looks like your uh, training, even when you were back there at home, was training <laughs> you for the policy side and for the, the community side. So yeah. how do you feel that that background that you had 
prepared you for the work that you did um, during the pandemic, particularly with the governor's emergency proclamation that you were a part of. And that, you know, speak to us a little bit about what that actually did, because I yeah. knew that this was happening, but I, oh. you know, it just kind of hear that it's happening, but you don't really know where it all started and got framed. So when I read this, I was like, oh, so this is where kind of all of this began because we knew that it was going on. So talk to us a little bit about, about what that looked like and also how um, your background you think prepared you for it. Yeah, so um, it's a complex question, so I'll try to meet it all. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll say the Center for Nursing, and I'm the director of the Center for Nursing here in Hawaii. Um, I think there's 36 in our nation at this point in time. We are in Hawaii, we are established by state law. Okay. And we have four mandates. We do workforce research, we support best practices and quality outcomes, and we also have two mandates related to recruitment and retention. So it's really important to us at the Center for Nursing, and we use this as a guiding principle for how we do policy work, is we apply the nursing process. We believe in evidence-based practice, mm -hmm. and we believe in evidence-based policy. And I don't see an option for us to engage without applying the nursing process. Mm -hmm. If we deviate from the nursing process, I, I believe that we have more potential to choose um, the wrong pathways forward. Mm -hmm. Because the nursing process starts with assessment and we have to understand the need, we have to understand the background, we have to understand the challenges before we determine what a solution is and implement it. Exactly. And so um, for everyone who's watching, remember the nursing process. <laughs> I live and die by the nursing process, even though I'm not doing direct patient care. Mm -hmm. And my team does too, even though we're not entirely nurses. We have many nursing adjacent people, um, but we, we do that assessment first. We don't stop doing that, even though we're not in clinical care. Right. So when the pandemic hit, um, I, we have a couple really unique unique situations in Hawaii. One is we are an island state. Um, that means that you're not driving three hours to the next county, town, or city. You're flying there. Mm -hmm. We have very strong, um, we, we initially, at the very beginning, our governor created very strong policies to prevent the spread to different islands. Um, and it helped us for a long time. And so we had travel quarantines. If you flew to Oahu, where 80% of our population lives, that's where Waikiki and the North Shore is. Mm -hmm. um, that's where the, the majority of our people live. Um, and for the neighbor islands, it would have required them a 14 day quarantine mm -hmm. when they got home. And we only have one testing site for the NCLEX in our state. That NCLEX testing site is on Oahu. So any mm -hmm. nursing student on any other island needed to fly. They always have to fly, but they needed to fly and then do a 14-day quarantine. Wow. And because also training sites were not determined to be essential businesses, mm -hmm. like, you know, we remember this, right? Like grocery stores, right. education, but not restaurants, not shopping malls, well, not also not testing centers. So you were essential as a student, you're essential once you got into the workforce, but you couldn't access that thing that needed to get you between the two. Wow. And in our state, because they initially shut down entirely, and then they started only prioritizing nursing and a couple other health at the testing location, a couple other health tests, um, certification exams. But then when they opened up fully, they can't say, oh, well, all your other professions don't matter. We're mm. only. So they had to open up the volume to everyone, but they still had reduced their capacity by 50% to create social distancing. Wow. So we went from having tests you could take in the week, like normal, to a six month or greater delay. Wow. Oh, my goodness. That is uh, very eye opening. <laughs> Right. Wow. And, and what we know from nursing education, so this goes back to the assessment, is when is a student most successful in passing the NCLEX? Yeah. It's three months after they exactly. graduate. Exactly. That's it. So we're impeding their success 
by trying to do right by the community and prevent spread and have them take COVID back. Uh, we tried getting travel quarantine exemption saying, well, what if they fly, go straight to the testing center, go straight back, don't talk to anybody, don't touch anything, wrap mm -hmm. yourself up in bubble wrap, gloves, masks, everything, get there, get back. And in some counties, they were allowing that. In other counties, they were not allowing that exception. Mm. So we were requiring a financial hardship because these people are also working. We know that on the neighbor islands, our nursing students are um, tend to be older, um, 27 to 35. And just thinking about our lives, we know yeah. that you might have kids, mm -hmm. you might be caring for your parents, you might have a car payment or yeah. paying for your own rent or, or mortgage. You're not cheap, right? No. You <laughs> require money to live. And so, but that 14 day quarantine means you're not going to work. Mm -hmm. um, we also, at that point in time, people were then flying to the continental United States. They were flying to Vegas or California or Oklahoma if they had family there so they wouldn't have to pay for a hotel. They were still being required to have a 14 day quarantine, but they weren't having to wait six months. Right. We contacted NCSBN and the testing site and asked them to open up testing sites on other islands and they refused. Wow. Um, their policy is that they need certain data securities and they felt like the only option on in the state of Hawaii is at the singular location that we have. So they don't Oh, they will not open up alternate testing sites on other islands. Mm -hmm. They will not do home proctoring for the nursing exam. They will not authorize it. They did open up other testing sites, mass testing sites, but these were in locations that had high population density. It was based off population. It was not based on delay to the test. So we saw testing sites open up in Texas, in Florida, mm -hmm. but they only had a six weeks delay and we had a six month delay. So our only option, and at the same time, we're looking at um, as an island state, and we are a small state, if we had a COVID surge, where would we get our nurses from? Yeah. That's we have the ability to bring in travelers, but the length of time it takes is much more difficult. It does require plane travel. It does require completely being displaced um, for those travel nurses. Uh, it is much more difficult to get a traveler in Hawaii. Yes, my brother was a traveling nurse in Hawaii for about uh, six or seven months. So that is oh, a really? process, yes. <laughs> it is a process, right. And at the same time, I'm looking like, I'm looking at the globe and there are red dots everywhere where there's COVID sur surges. So I also know as a workforce planner, right? We're not gonna find nurses in excess. Like flu season, like we have a flu season actually that kind of starts in January, February. Mm -hmm. So the mainland has their flu season. Right. We have our flu season afterwards. So your travel nurses are available to us. That's not the case with COVID, right? right. We're all having problems mm -hmm. at the same time. All of the travel nurses are going elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And certainly not to necessarily to Oahu because there, there are regions that are paying higher um, and or are having needs sooner. And so they're getting obligated earlier. Mm -hmm. So that took us to um, that took us to where we determined. So that's assessment, right? That's our assessment. Um, so we came up with a plan and the plan initially was we just got to use these new grads. Right. We've got to get these new grads in and practicing so they don't get rusty and tell them just keep on keep on refreshing when you're at home right. to get um to get that exam and get it when you get it ask for the time off if you're working but you've got to get your foot in the door um because if we run out of nurses like we need you so that's what we did i um have the great fortune of having a really really good relationship with the board of nursing Mm -hmm. And so we worked through the logistics with the Board of Nursing, made sure that from a regulatory perspective, even if there was a waiver, we wouldn't be uh, threatening public safety or threatening mm -hmm. nurse licensure. We looked at creating temporary licenses or waiving, and waiving was a better option. Mm -hmm. 
So we worked with DCCA, our Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs, Professional and Vocational Licensing Division, at the Executive Officer um, of the Board of Nursing. Um, she's just a pleasure to work with. And then I also happen through my um, through my work, um, the person who used to be the director of the Department of Labor, and I sit on a I have I'm in an advisory board role in the um, for the director of the Department of Labor for Healthcare. Well, that person who had that seat a couple of years ago is currently the chief for the chief of staff for our governor. Wow. And so thankfully I had access and I don't pretend to think I will ever have that um, access ever in the mm -hmm. future. But I, so I made the phone call and said, we really need to get these nurses. Um, we cannot undermine and undercut our ability to respond and new grads are necessary. Wow, that is just amazing. There's so many parts of that uh, assessment piece that I would not have thought about even as a nurse, you know, because your situation is so unique, you know, but the approach is definitely uh, amazing that you all were able to come to that conclusion and to be able to get such a good process in place. What was the student's response to it? And did you have any pushback from any uh, other entities along the way as you moved in that direction? No. So the students, what we did, I mean, we're nurses, right? We educate. So what we did is as soon as that waiver came through, we provided communication to all of the schools of nursing that they could um, supply to their nurse graduates. We provided the waiver language. We provided additional guidance. So if you were working under this waiver, you needed to be working with the supervision of a licensed nurse at your equivalent right. level. So an right. LPN to an LPN, yeah. R and to R, APR and APR. Yeah. Um, so we provided that guidance to them explaining what the criteria was. We also provided a template letter that they could provide to their potential employer with the links to the proclamation so that they also were grounded in those requirements. Um, we also saw <clears throat> later on, so in August, so that we got that through in about May, June. And then in August, we had our surge and we ended up having to do a call for nurses because we weren't gonna be able to bring travelers in time. We're actually currently in a certain, a similar but worse situation right now. Mm -hmm. Same time of year, same mm -hmm. story. Yeah. Um, but last year we, we also put out a call for nurses and we got 1900 responses worldwide. Mm -hmm. um, we got a response from Sweden, that's a long way away. <laughs> um, and a lot, of, a lot of the new grads responded and so, it, the results or the outcomes, one, were that nurses were able to be hired. Um, and we don't actually know the exact number because we weren't, um, we were just responding to the need. We weren't trying to track or study these mm -hmm. outcomes. Mm -hmm. Not the time. We didn't have the time. For that. No, nobody had the time <laughs> to do that. But that's amazing. And, you know, really, when you were saying that the different, you know, RN to RN and APRN to APRN, it just, it even provided almost a mentoring kind of situation, you know, which yeah. really, uh, even though the one purpose was to, you know, handle the problem at hand, but these nurses probably are really going to benefit from the fact that they were able to be partnered and to have that continue and to use their skill set and everything as they move towards, um, you know, being able to get their NCLEX and, and to be licensed. So yeah. do you feel like the situation now has changed a little bit? Are you all still operating with the same parameters now that we've moved uh, one year plus into this pandemic? It's hard to say that, but this is where we are. So um, the availability of testing, which didn't, we, you know, we didn't really have, we had some testing, right, but it was very sparse at the mm -hmm. beginning. So the availability of text, testing improved um, access to certified exams because it removed the travel barrier. And then uh, of June of this year, we also, if you were vaccinated, then you don't have the quarantine requirements at all. So there is more, uh, uh, an improved ability to travel again. Mm -hmm. uh, we have not seen an improvement in um, getting a test. We have, there seems to be no opportunity to get testing sites on other islands. And if I can just talk about that for a moment. Sure. Our communities, our neighbor island communities are more rural. Um, 
They have higher Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander populations. Uh, and we also know, because we study at the Center for Nursing, uh, our, the education programs or nursing education programs. And so we know that they are tend to be older. They're not the traditional high school entry student necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, and I have great concerns that this commitment to a proprietary process, this owned NCLEX certification and the standards of data security are so high that we are, and, and with the goal of, of ensuring public safety, they want to know that, you know, like I'm not taking your test, right? right. Mm -hmm. um, they want to know that the right person is taking the right test mm -hmm. um, and they have set a high standard, but I have really big concerns that it is at the, the cost to rural um, and underrepresented nurses. Uh, mm -hmm. They are not necessarily more financially advantaged, but they are certainly being asked to be more financially disadvantaged to mm -hmm. enter in nursing. Um, it is a higher cost to travel. I live on Oahu, I, I went down the road, I paid for free parking. The cost to me was the cost of the exam. Mm -hmm. But somebody on a neighbor island, and even in communities um, in on the continental United States, if you're having to fly or travel to a testing site, mm -hmm. you're paying for transportation, you might have to be paying for a hotel room, mm -hmm. the food at a restaurant is more expensive than what you make at home. There's test anxiety, right? So if you are not used to big city traffic and suddenly you're in it, um, that's going to compromise your comfort level and your resolve when you go to take that test, you might have poor outcomes. And we actually do see really high outcomes. I think our neighbor island schools have done a good job preparing students, um, but I don't think that we can ignore the, uh, the systemic barriers that are created for accessing your nursing career once you have successfully graduated. And yeah, that is uh, something that is, you know, very profound because one thing that we've been able to see with COVID is that, and, and with everything that's happened around the pandemic and the testing issue that you're talking about too, is that communities that are already in some way marginalized or disenfranchised and you have nurses, those are the communities, first of all, that we need the nurses in because like you, they know the community. So they already have that tie that's there and that vested interest. So we want them, we want nurses from the community, we want them to grow their nurses, but the barriers that are there that you're speaking about, that's a way that I haven't thought about it, that, you know, just the mere cost. I mean, like you, for me, I lived 75 miles from my testing center. I just drove up here. I was familiar with this city, you know, the capital city where I live now, you know, I didn't have to pay for testing, you know, I mean, it, I mean, I didn't have to pay for parking or anything. It was all not a big deal. I didn't have to spend the night. So um, there was a whole, a whole nother layer. There's a whole nother layer that's there. And when you think about flying from an island, you know, I'm not even a person that flies. So I know that would have definitely been, been a barrier, you know, anxiety wise for me, you know? <laughs> to have to take the test. So that is, wow. Have you all come, uh, been able to make any headway with any solutions to this at all? Or, you know, because this is something no. I had not thought about at all or. Mm. No. So, um, and, and I just want to share that nursing was not the only profession that um, encountered this challenge. Uh, the testing site is also used by medicine. And so we saw a delay in oh, wow. with, me, with medical student progression. <laughs> and they take wow. tests a lot throughout mm -hmm. their education. Oh yeah, I didn't think the about that. Like for pharmacy. Mm -hmm. And we have one school of pharmacy. It's in Hilo, which is on the big island. It's on another island. Wow. And all of those students have to fly into Oahu. So, I mean, we're talking, this is not just a nursing issue. This is a healthcare issue. We have... Um, there was a report that came out, I don't know, two or three weeks ago. Uh, it counted the uh, physician shortages um, mm -hmm. by county, listed mm -hmm. the worst physician shortages by county in the nation. Maui County, 
Wow. Kauai County, we're top 10, I believe, or top 15. And Hilo or Ho Hawaii County, which is where the big, the big island, it's also called Hawaii, mm -hmm. um, I think was number one. And so when you're talking about access to health care, and if somebody is, I didn't even, as a student, nursing student, I didn't even think of looking into the challenge of getting a test, right? I just knew that I had to do that in the future. I'd figure it out last semester. Mm -hmm. um, that conversation is being had the entire time these other students wow. on are um, going through their educational pathway. Um, and even if you know that you need these exams, um, it's a if if you're part of a family or a community or you have the mentor who can help you consider about this, it's part of the dialogue. Mm -hmm. But if it's if you're a first time college goer, who yeah. is going to tell you about this and help mm -hmm. you process these requirements and help you get into the mindset and give you that talk, right? Mm -hmm. Not just the talk about oh this is what's going to be done, but the talk when you're about to get on the flight and be like you got this, you know exactly. this, exactly, right? And for that non traditional student, the older student, which I was, I didn't get my first degree at all till I was 36 years old. So for the older student that's already managing, I mean, there's such a, you know, you're here at this point and now you have this extra barrier that's there. Sometimes that can be the determining factor as to whether you'll even finish or not, you know, when you have right. to have that conversation and you have kids and family and parents and all these other things that are playing in. And, and, I went into nursing as an adult. You you started your whole educational process as an adult. It's also you're taking off. I I cried oh. and I called my stepdad <laughs> and I was like, I cannot go to nursing school. I can't take on this student debt. And he's like, Laura, you're investing in yourself. Like mm -hmm. sign it, or I'm flying over mm -hmm. and I'm gonna. I'm gonna you sign need it. You need a cheerleader. I had and the cheerleaders needed, on my team. Yeah. <laughs> I needed my family to be like, Laura, you cannot do what you're mm -hmm. doing today. You need exactly. you need a brighter future. Go for it. Do it. Exactly. Invest. Wow. Is but there if any? You don't have that. That's yeah. you don't have that person who's like, it's okay to jump off this cliff because mm -hmm. you've got a person. Right. You know. And it's almost like nursing itself needs to become that for some nurses, you know, in the sense that the mentoring process, I was watching um, CBS this morning and there was a program that they're talking about that they're doing that involves pen pals kind of between women in similar situations. And I thought, you know, as you're thinking about it, I'm thinking that even to be able to do, uh, you know, a program that would allow students to partner that have already successfully completed to partner with someone that's in their similar situation in that locale, because, you know, the nurse that's there in Hawaii is facing something completely different than I might be facing here in continental U.S but there has to be something, you know, there that will be that added piece, you know, because um, this is something I would never have thought of, you know, yeah. as a barrier, you know, and uh, wow. I, you know, I, and we, we do research. I'm not a researcher myself, but we do a lot of research and part of, I'm part of the National Forum of State Nursing Workforce Centers. And we have a lot of conversations about barriers Oregon has done some great work and they figured out, well, the state doesn't have a, well, this was before COVID. The mm -hmm. state doesn't have a nursing workforce shortage, but communities do. Right. So there's poor distribution. We haven't looked at it that way in Hawaii, but we really believe we, it's the same thing. Well, we've mm -hmm. got, we've got enough nurses on Oahu, but not necessarily enough on the other islands. Their margin is so much smaller. And we even across specialties, right? Like all of our new grads want to go into acute care, but half of our jobs are in long-term care and mm -hmm. other set insurance, other settings. And so they say, oh, there's no jobs. And I'm like, what are you doing right now? They're like, oh, I'm a long-term care nurse. And I'm like, you are a nurse. <laughs> yes, that's essential <laughs> where you are. That's where the need is. Yeah. Wow. But so there's, I think there's also an opportunity from a research perspective to look at the applicants to nursing programs in rural communities, who gets accepted, mm -hmm. who completes, and then who takes the NCLEX. Mm -hmm. And where is the loss? Where is the melt along that exactly. perspective? Mm -hmm. Future of Nursing Report came out. It had a huge call for improving 
equity and diversity in nursing. Mm -hmm. And I was just looking at the numbers uh, yesterday, actually, our, our demographics in nursing. We have the more advantaged communities in our state becoming nurses. Mm -hmm. And we have not not enough nurses who are Native Hawaiian, who are Pacific Islander. Mm -hmm. We have not enough nurses who are the more recent immigrant groups from Asia, for instance. Right. We don't have the representation that is really needed for the patients who are receiving that care. Right. And also from an economic perspective, nursing is stable, nursing has a bright future. Nursing can get you out of poverty mm -hmm. um, or there's that Alice. I don't know if you guys have Alice reports in your community, but it's um, the people right above it that is still living to paycheck to paycheck, but they're not poverty anymore. Exactly. Well, any nursing degree gets you out of that. Right. And that's, I'm sure something that's going on in the communities where I, I am and where we yeah. are. Exactly. So nursing is a, is a pathway forward. And it, and then the diversity, right? I mean, I, I'm better at policy than I am at patient care, but look, I get to be a nurse who does policy. That's wonderful. I mean, and I, it's and women's health, right? And educate. You do education. You do research. You do quality mm -hmm. informatics. You do leadership management, patient you do, care. Yeah, you get to do all of that, and and it's important. It's important work, and you know, I'm so glad that we had this conversation. And I'm thinking too about nursing students as we educate them. Um, and particularly those that we I teach in the um, nurse practitioner program, so not as work much as much work with the undergraduate. But how do we kind of give them this sense of what they need to do policy wise and also in moving the profession forward? Because I think that like um, a lot of the other health care care entities, COVID has shown some cracks that are there in the foundation that we knew were there. We knew we had a nursing shortage. We knew there were diversity issues, things like that. But this has shined more of a light on it. But how do we educate them as far as policy? I mean, is it going to be more of being a uh, membership? Because I know one thing I, I, I think we need to talk about is membership in your professional organizations, because I know yeah. a lot of nurses don't do that. But being someone that works on the side of policy, what do we say to these nursing students as they go out, you know, into these communities that they need to be doing not just for the community, but also for the nursing profession where they are? Um, I mean, very simply, a the first place to always start is understanding your scope of practice and your pr nurse practice act. Mm -hmm. um, and then I always do two things. The, the starting point for me is always the nursing process and where does this policy sit? Okay. That's the first question. And it's, and it is, you can apply it to everything. So find the patient included into the nursing coursework when you're writing up your patient and you're saying, all right, well, is this, let's look at the nursing process. Am I, do I have a child with type one diabetes and what's their access to insulin at school? I don't, you know, it can be yeah. anything, right? But the nursing process and then where does the policy sit? Is this an organizational policy? Is this a state rule? Is it a state law or is it a federal law? Because sometimes, and I just got an email, I get so many emails about this. It's like, well, we need to write a law about this because we can't do this at work. And I'm like, I, that's not in the scope of practice. It's not a barrier. It's not a federal barrier that I know of. I think it's an organizational barrier. Exactly. We don't need a state law to fix your organizational barrier. You can be a change agent there. Right. And I think, and I think that comes into play so often with nursing practice at the RN level, LPN level, RN level, certainly at the APRN level, where you can you can help people understand for APRNs, the consensus model, helping people understand, well, this is my scope of practice and then I can get trained to do other things like procedures. That's competency. That, that is kind of dependent on my certification and education. And you don't need a state law to allow me to do this thing. It's already allowed, right? And, and that's gonna help me serve patients. You can do that at, with nursing as well. So having that practical knowledge, I think we have to recontextualize it though. I feel like when I learned it policy, it was very theory-based. Mm -hmm. and, 
And I think if we just bring it back to those really simple steps, you know, what is the nursing process? What is the problem? And then when we're doing that assessment, is it policy? Is it organization? Is it state? Is it federal? Or is it, or is it ethics? Right? Yeah. Because a lot of what we do is definitely that, you know, it definitely is based that, on that. Yeah. That's it, it, it. Sometimes we just don't do things because of ethics and that's not necessarily going to be written in law, but it's like that unspoken policy do. that's there. Yeah. That's the bigger <laughs> that policy. So right? true. That's the ultimate policy. Exactly. So Th that I think we can have that dialogue. I think it, uh, when you're debriefing and there is a patient who's restrained, well, maybe we can talk about that in a debrief and talk about where the policies, what the organizational policy is, if there are any state laws. That requires preparation for the faculty. And I think that's a challenge is that these conversations don't always come up and allow someone to look into the issue, but maybe it's a long-term discussion. Maybe when the student is in, their psych or their community of course there's there's a thread that's continued throughout um i think that there you know it's not just about writing testimony which is so important but more of policy is understanding what our scope of practice is and what our barriers are mm -hmm. and it's not about getting to do more it's about in my community we didn't have anyone to talk to us about safe sex when we were kids. Yeah, that's important, you know, it's and that's the same. Care. Yeah, that's the same and everywhere, you know. Yeah, and even you, here where we have some sex ed classes, the, you know, curriculum is being taught sometimes. And it's not necessarily by, you know, it's not enough and information not a health there. Health yeah, right? mm -hmm. it's not a health it, professional. Yeah. Thinking back about it, I don't think we had a school nurse at our high school, mm. you know. So that is policy. That is knowing that the right people are educating. That is having access. Do teenagers know how, or are there even enough healthcare providers that they can access? Is it their school nurse? Is it an APRN at a clinic they can walk to? Um, is it a call line? Now we have telehealth. Now can they just FaceTime them? Um, that's access to care and if we have a state law that prevents it or doesn't fund it yeah we need to look those, at those kids things. adults those elderly folks are not receiving that health care and that's why scope of practice is important that's why having people who are grounded in your community need to be health care providers Yes, we definitely do. I mean, you make me want to go. I mean, I've recently pulled the Nurse Practice Act because we've had some changes in our scope of practice here as APRNs in South Carolina. Um, you know, and we do, I love my state, but we do have some some barriers to care. And, you know, when you talk about uh, STI and things like that with young people, we are one of two states that won't allow um, partner therapy, you know, for oh, the treatment of STIs. You know, so there are things like that that we definitely need to be looking at. And I think if nothing else, um, COVID has opened up a lot of conversations and it's brought a lot um, more of these policy, uh, institutional, organizational type policy things to the forefront and made us look at them to see what we're doing and what we need to do. And a lot of things with telehealth, I mean, treated UTIs, you know, things that we prob yeah. probably could have been doing before, that there's evidence to show that the outcome wouldn't be any different. So it definitely yeah. has been an advance. And I don't think we'll be going back, you know. Um, no. I know I, we had planned to go into telehealth phase into it. And then all of a sudden it was like, okay, we're going to telehealth today. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Too, so and I think from the policy perspective, we've already, we've always focused so much on the physical exam. Right. And now if, if we're doing telehealth for things that we used to do a physical exam, from a policy perspective, we've got to make sure that the organizational policies are in place to exactly. protect the nurse so that they can do that and also protect the patient by ensuring that the nurse is doing safe telehealth assessment. And so I think that's another way that we have to do policy and it, and it would be a really good place for education to practice those it skills. It definitely would be. And I will definitely yeah. pass all of this on. Uh, <laughs> the, the faculty, I'll encourage them to watch this because there's a lot there that you spoke about that I wasn't aware of. You know, when I think about Hawaii, I just think about I want to take a vacation out there, but I don't think about it as this is a place where people are living that has the same type of issues, problems, and concerns that are unique to that community as are unique to the South or the North or the Midwest. Yeah. 
And so uh, I thank you so much for giving us that um, perspective on what's going on there. And we certainly, uh, I know that they're going to move forward uh, in a positive direction with great minds like yours, thinking uh, all the things that you do and doing all the great work. So we appreciate you so much for being a champion in that area. And I thank you for taking time this early in the morning to uh, <laughs> take a moment to talk with us. So please um, take advantage when you get a chance. I'm sure that Andrew will pass on both my contact information as well as the information on how you can view our interview and share it with others because a lot of what you said is definitely something that um, I'm going to think about and that our nurses in general need to think about on the policy side. So thank you so much, Laura. Thank you. It was All so right. good to talk to you today. Good to talk to you too. Well. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.